To go far with blockchain technology, industries and organizations must go together. But the journey is not always easy, and it's most often not. In today's session, Jenny, Suzanne, and I will candidly share our experience with finding common ground in blockchain consortia. Thank you for joining. I'm Nadia Hewitt, project lead for blockchain and data for common purpose at the World Economic Forum. I'm headquartered at our office in San Francisco, um, the center for the fourth industrial revolution. And we focus on four technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence, internet of things, and other. Uh, the World Economic Forum is the organization for public and private um, cooperation. Hi, everyone. I'm Suzanne Somerville. I'm CEO at Chronicled. Uh, we are working to create enterprise solutions powered by blockchain, serving the life science and healthcare industry. And we are the custodians of the Metal Ledger Network, which is already deploying production solutions uh, to help solve business problems. I'm Jenny Sheplock. I'm a partner at Latham & Watkins in our DC office. Latham & Watkins is an international law firm. My practice focuses on consortia, um, both specifically for blockchain and otherwise for financial industry participants. I've spent my career helping industry participants organize new services and platforms for, for the fintech industry. And I've recently co-authored a chapter of the World Economics Forum Blockchain Development Toolkit, um, where I have written a chapter on consortium governance. Yeah. So at the World Economic Forum, we work with blockchain consortia across multiple industries and sectors. And what we see is that CEOs, um, those who are experimenting with blockchain technology, they are recognizing that industry-wide collaboration around blockchain is necessary. So that proof of concepts, standards, solutions can be adopted at industry scale. But while the rewards from collaboration can be high, agreeing on what a well-designed consortia governance system looks like and finding common ground in between many company agendas, competitors, and diverse perspectives can be challenging. So, Suzanne and Jenny, a question that we get at the World Economic Forum a lot is that, you know, we... Consortia, ecosystems, industries, they want to be inclusive. But how do you ensure that governance is not viewed as overly exclusive while still creating a functional system? I mean, this goes back to already the early days of consortia making, where you need to decide how many companies to include in the initial stages, how many gets to set the, the rules of the road, right? And um, you want to create something that's effective that can scale, it can be agile, can move fast, um, especially considering, you know, this post-COVID world where we really need to be agile and responsive. But at the same time, you want to be inclusive. You want to make sure that you include a small, medium-sized enterprises that you... So, so um, maybe, Jenny, starting with you, like from a legal standpoint, a create, creating a solution that will really be transformative, you want it to be open, but... but Considering legal requirements, what is it that you see? How does this play out in consortia that you've been involved with? Well, we do get a lot of questions when we're representing consortia over what are the legal requirements for access? What do we need to do to ensure that we are in compliance with antitrust and competition laws? And those considerations are actually very different from the inclusivity considerations that you talked about, Nadia. Um, most of the antitrust issues that we see, in addition to just having competitors work with each other and refraining from having competitively sensitive discussions, are you don't want your solution to, to prohibit people who are otherwise qualified to participate. You don't want to have a situation where you say, okay, we're having an auto part supply chain, but we don't like Volkswagen, and so we're not going to let them participate. Um, what you what you what you can do is you can have set criteria for who can access and use your solution, um, and that's certainly fine. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to have subjective criteria for who can and who cannot have access to the actual solution. Um, 
But from a legal perspective, there's nothing that is stopping industry participants from saying, we as an exclusive club are going to design this solution and then allow people to use it. That's more of a practical question because if you as an exclusive club are designing a solution and you're not allowing input from say your customers, that it doesn't really, it doesn't really drive adoption. Um, so what I've seen in my practice is, is typically when my clients are getting together to create a consortium, if they're all say on one side of an industry, they want to make sure that people on the other side of an industry have a say in how that solution will work because those people are also going to be end users. And to really drive network effects, you really need people participating in the conversations about how a solution works. That doesn't mean that the solution has to be owned by everyone in the industry. It doesn't mean that the profits from that solution have to go to everyone in the industry, but it does mean that to drive adoption, what you really want is you want to you want to give people buy-in, whether that's through some kind of informal design committee process or whether it's really having formal votes on, on how the business is structured. So that's I, I think that's something that all of my consortium clients strive to do is to get input from, from all different sorts of users. Yeah, and I can build off what Jenny said. As we've uh, tackled use cases, I would say some of the most important work we've had is picking use cases where all parties really have uh, a vested interest to solve the problem. Um, it makes it actually quite easy for them all to come to the table and work collaboratively. Um, with the Metal Ledger Network, we're actually aiming for industry protocols. So it's actually really important that we get perspectives from large and medium-sized companies, really understand the nuance of how the process operates in the industry today, and how we can define um, a, a new way for the process to operate that everyone can participate in, that isn't um, uh, excluding uh, companies, whether it's by the actual business rules that we're encoding in smart contracts, or maybe it's even how easy or difficult is it for the infrastructure to be able to participate. So all those aspects, honestly, from our, I will say, uh, you know, vested business interest, it only behooves us as Chronicle to make sure that we've got all those perspectives. And I will say another nice aspect is because Chronicle really is a technology provider we actually can play the role of almost a neutral Switzerland in the room, and everyone can trust us in the consortia to ensure that one set of parties does not get an advantage over the other. And we, we actually operate on the premise of industry first, and it's sort of the guiding principle that we often come back to, to ensure that we're aiming for, again, these protocols that can be adopted industry-wide. Mm. So we've, we've seen very similar, and I think, um, involving others being inclusive it's already starts at the proof of value stage um i still hear too often that uh, a group who's, who wants to to do a proof of concept and wants to prove proof of value they go off and say oh let me try blockchain but then they don't have a set of success objectives that really involves others you know they do the 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 proof of concept they they test the value for their organization which is also where the paradigm shift with blockchain comes in. The fact that it is such an ultimate uh, distribu network technology that if you prove the value and you look at the return of investment, you really do need to involve others um, in that. And then it's safe to say that if not, then the organization will likely miss some of the key design points that will incentivize others to participate in the future. Uh, Suzanne, I, I'm wondering, um, with your experience, you say sort of, you know, industry trust the technology provider and, and how do you, how does, how does what your work do, how do you ensure that industry stays involved and have a say? How do, how do you, yeah, is there anything, any insights or practices you can share from ensuring yeah. that industry keeps control and that keeps control in a, yeah, their interests are looked after. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say there's some really nice, I would say, economic incentivization, like I mentioned. Chronicled wants to build this technology. It's in our business interest. So it behooves us to really keep our ears open, listening to the customers, understanding where there may be conflict, and figuring out how to design a solution 
we often say, can it boil down to almost like just better plumbing between companies that they actually can do business better, but it isn't a strategic driver per se, that it's not giving one company a strategic advantage or another by the design, but just allows plumbing for them to be able to better um, use the business terms they already use with their trading partners to do business better, whether it's automated, whether it's rule enforcement that can happen automatically between companies. So I would say um, to really think about it in that regard, if you really are finding conflict between um, different components, let's say of the industry and how they would benefit or not benefit from the use case, I would question, can you, can you change the design principles that take it back again to just better plumbing to exchange and validate transactions and data and leave it up to them of how they decide to want, they want to do business. Right. I mean, I think that that's a great point. And, and when you talk about technology and, and connectivity, I think that's another point where you need to be fostering collaboration with your users. You need to be making sure that when you're doing your proof of value, your users see value not only in the technology itself, but how it can be integrated into their current workflows. Because what you don't want is you don't want to just present some out-of-the-box solution that people will then have to go through huge difficulties in integrating with their current workflows. You want something that will be easy for your technology teams of your end users and also for the, the people that are actually going to be using the product on a day-to-day -day basis to understand and actually, and actually use and have it make sense for them. Maybe another hurdle, though, that we found is it still takes some work to get companies to realize that they can be in the room with their competitor and they're not losing something. Um, I think a lot of people have come from the, from the premise, they're my competitor, I don't wanna do anything that's gonna make their business better, even though they're holding on to the, the toys so tightly that they can't get the value out of it either. So I think there's also an education with companies, and I think we've also been able to demonstrate for new companies that are curious about participating, we actually let them join in on some calls that they, I think, are often pleasantly surprised how collaborative the conversations are and to get them in the mindset that uh, we're looking at processes that are not a strategic advantage for anyone. They're just pain points for all parties involved and that realizing by working together, they'll all win um, and getting them to that mind mindset uh, sometimes takes a little extra work. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. There's a few, you know, low-hanging fruit in terms of, creating that collaborative environment. So a few that I've seen work really well for those of you who are setting out on a blockchain consortia journey or looking to work with, with, with competitors. Um, uh, having sort of impartial meeting grounds, Suzanne mentioned, you know, the Switzerland of, but most blockchain consortia that have had success so far or we, they've seen momentum, they had originally you know, a nexus, a common glue, whether that is an academia organization or a nonprofit. I mean, the World Economic Forum, we've also played a role there in being that sort of safe space, right? That that convening platform at first, because competitors at first might be very wary of joining company X or joining the neighbor that are specifically like joining their solution. So it's then easier to join the solution of sort of that common ground, right? So that has been, I've, I've seen work well and, and speak, I think, to what Suzanne just mentioned. And then um, also I've seen some other consortia doing the same thing where they, companies who's interested in joining, where they have maybe a periodic call, right? Or specifically for those who's not yet members to sort of give them feedback and insights uh, to what the group is working on. Um, because at first you might have to, to, only include some companies at first, and as others join, it's still a useful way to keep them engaged, right? Have a distribution that makes sure that they they are getting feedback and insights on what the group is, is working on. Mm -hmm. Nadia, I'm actually going to disagree with something that you just said. Yeah. Um, I think, at least in the financial industry, I've seen a big shift over the course of my career, really, from from financial institutions being very concerned about proprietary methods and source code control, et cetera, et cetera, to a real collaborative development environment. And I think the same is true in other industries. Blockchain is a big part of that, 
but it's not the only part because like you were saying, um, and like Suzanne was saying, there's a, there's a lot of processes and pain points that companies have in common that they, that they can be comfortable sharing and working out together. Um, I think in the financial industry, it's always been a little bit more, people have always been a little bit more open to that because there is this interaction between buyers and sellers. And there's been coming together in a, in a marketplace that all participants use. So there's definitely been, there's, there's always been that willingness to sort of say, here's what I want out of an exchange. But you, it's true that you also do need that neutral party where if you're saying something that is going to reveal some proprietary strategy, you want to be able to keep that from your competitors. So yes. even in the profit space, yeah. what I've is that typically you'll you'll want to have someone who is who is neutral, whether that's just a consultant or whether you're forming a new entity that is going to operate a service. Um, you definitely you want someone who can be Switzerland, as you said. Yeah, and I think that is again very industry dependent. There are industries that have before blockchain even have been already better at at collaborating, whether they were forced to because of the economics just changing and you know. Or not. I mean, there's still industry that's extremely fragmented where companies, competitors are still putting up huge data silos, artificial silos, right, to, to keep their competitive advantages. And who just, it, it, it's a big shift for them. And then that neutral space does help um, with that. What I also always talk to CEOs about is the fact that for those industries that are, that are very hesitant to share, right, and if again, maybe more fragmented, is to understand that blockchain also offers an opportunity for them to defend against platform models. There are still many industries where platform models can can disrupt, right, um, incumbents. And blockchain allows for the industry to, to, to defend against platforms, to do a lot of the things that platforms does, but in a way that's more decentralized, right? And in a way that they still can re- uh, retain some of the power, if one can say that, <laughs> that way. Actually, Jenny, we've uh, looked at the financial industry with Envy because uh, banks and other institutions have had to be interoperable for quite a long time. I think that common ground was found uh, much earlier I think in other industries, uh, coming to the table with your competitors, I think there's always innovators who see the potential and want to make it happen. But I've also heard from folks uh, that they know of a certain industry or certain parts of the world where a competitor would, you know, not over their dead body, get at the table with another competitor. It's all very cutthroat business. And it'll be fun to see how it evolves. I personally think as blockchain-based use cases come into production and members of an industry see the value that their competitors are getting, they will come on board. But it's going to be a little bit of a journey and it's hopefully having enough of the innovators at the table who are willing to take the chances to help ensure that the first deployments of this technology. Yes, um, and I think, Suzanne, you actually mentioned one uh, piece of advice earlier around where you have industries where there's uh, less collaboration, where they tend to, you know, compete and they're not, you know, used to working together. And, and we see some of those that just would not come to the table and and start building out solutions. With them, it's picking use cases. It's picking use cases that are not competitive, right? So um, they're, so yeah, where you can look at common pain points and where it can help them as an industry just make the pie bigger and they all can get their share. Yeah. So another thing that, that comes up is uh, that we see as a, as a, as a point of um, attention is the short-term and long-term value proposition. So when organizations start working together, they're all doing it for their own reasons, right? Some of them might just want to explore, uh, do research and development of other companies. Others are in, you know, more for the long-term value of what it can offer. So during the formation of sort of business-focused ecosystems, it is critical to reach agreement on not just the initial value levers to be pursued by the ecosystem, but also the longer-term vision to be pursued. Um, I'd love to hear if you've had experience with same and again, any insights or, or lessons that's useful as companies navigate such challenges. 
Yeah, I can start. Um, I've had, uh, obviously, bringing people to the table in the life science industry, it actually started with regulations that are requiring them to be more interoperable about the track and trace of prescription medicine. Um, but then we had a shift from designing solutions to solve those immediate business problems to actually companies asking us for that long-term picture, that their ability to sell it to their executives was really reliant on the fact that this was not just a single solution, but really a, a journey for that value. But then at the same time, we've had companies come back, even with that long-term picture, and still are driving uh, business decision-making based on ROI of a specific solution. So I would say we've been hit on both sides, wanting that long-term value, but still at times needing to justify the short-term value in order to really sign on on board. And we're navigating it case by case, but it's a, it's a, it's a really great um, thing to think about as you're talking to companies. And maybe it comes down to the individual. These individuals really need the long-term picture. These individuals really need the short-term picture. Mm -hmm. I've been very lucky in my career to have worked with a great group of entities that have taken a long view and have done some strategic investments in some in some really interesting use cases. So those strategic investments teams are less worried about day one profitability and, and more interested in the long term. And meanwhile, the end users at their companies can can focus more on, well, we don't need to fund this solution. Our strategic investments arm has done that. So we can concentrate on working to make it, to making, to make sure it actually is implemented properly. Um, and I think that has, that has really helped some of my clients who are the recipients of consortium investments. Um, I think for, for any big enterprise, they're in, in spite of in spite of having to think about quarterly P and Ls and ROI from a technology perspective, your perspective, you're going to have to take the long view just because implementation and making changes to big infrastructure takes a long time and takes a lot of resources and commitment. So it's almost it's almost as though you have to take the long view and you have to sell it that way. But for those startups that are are just beginning and who need funding, that that can require a more immediate focus. And so it does it does help to have that initial strategic investment. Yes. Yeah, we've seen uh, both cases sort of play out in the post-COVID world. So COVID in many ways have um, incentivized, you know, certain industries to work on blockchain as a solution, right? So the shared truth, the resilience of blockchain. So many, especially with supply chains, right? They're looking again at the proof of concepts they did the last few years, sort of, you know, dusting it off and looking at it again to say, okay, now we do really need to make change, Um so then we see them willing to take that long-term vision. But then there's companies who with COVID, you know, are under tremendous uh, financial pressure and they're not really willing to invest when there is no short-term return. So we'll be interested in seeing how this all play out. But I cannot agree more that with blockchain technology, you do need to, to have that long-term vision and understand and, and that it's the long-term value drivers that you should be after. Yeah, I mean, in the end, what we often found is really coming back to basics. What is the economic interest of these companies to participate? What do they get out of it? Uh, short term, long term. Some are much more um, deep in thought of trying to think through the long term chess game, right? How is this going to benefit me? What are the potholes that I need to protect against? And I think that's kind of the uh. sort of fun of... Uh, uh, of blockchain is it will disrupt things, right? We can solve short-term problems, but disruption is coming. And what form that disruption will take, I think not, no one fully knows yet, right? We have visions of what the future will look like, but how individual companies adapt to that, how they change their business model, I think that's still to be seen and figured out. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be an incremental change too. I know that there are, there are so many people who are talking about changing the world through blockchain and and putting putting the entire system whatever of whatever your industry does onto the blockchain. But I think once we start to move into production, people are going to say, okay, wait, no, we actually need to slow down and think about this and 
what are the ramifications and and maybe we just start with baby steps whether that's just having documentation on the blockchain as opposed to having full transactions on the blockchain so that's another reason that the long view is really necessary yeah absolutely so um coming up in time here i want to invite uh the audience members to go and have a look at the World Economic Forum's recently launched toolkit, which Jenny also participated in, Redesigning Trust Blockchain Deployment Toolkit. There are about three modules um, in there that talks about blockchain governance, consortia governance, and has insights, lessons, best practices from more than 200 organizations around the world. Coming up as well, we're working on models for dispute resolution. And I think with the topic of finding common ground, I'd love to hear from Suzanne and Jenny what your experience has been with, with dispute resolution, especially within more private dispute resolution models, um, right? And I think at the end of the day, our goal is to increase the likelihood of success and industry-wide adoption of key blockchain solutions. And networks will never really grow if there's no clear path toward resolving disputes. Um, so yeah, what, what Suzanne within the life uh, science uh, industry, is this something that is shown to be a barrier? Is there any, any insights you can share? So first, I just want to give a plug to the World Economic Forum uh, work. It's really extraordinary. And I think anyone who is exploring blockchain, it's an in invaluable resource to help uh, people on their, on their journey. Um, in our world to date, again, I think uh, we haven't had a lot of really concerning disputes among companies, like I mentioned earlier, by really focusing on, I would say, plumbing that makes it um, easier to do business with each other. There really has been nothing that has driven um, a dispute. I mean, I'll give you a very simple example. Um, the business rules we're coding into the, the blockchain um, ensures that only a company that controls it's company prefixes, which are embedded in prescription medicine item numbers. They're the only company that can add data, modify data. No one would argue with that. I mean, they're just very, very basic rules. So I would say to date, we haven't had issue, but when issues, maybe little ones have arise, arisen, we step back and look at our design to try and understand um, how can we design it differently to accommodate everyone. So it's, it's very collaborative and, uh, we try very hard to make sure that we can meet the companies where they're at so that, frankly, we can drive broad adoption of these um, solutions. Yeah, um, I, I think I, I hate to go back and, and be constantly saying, well, the financial industry is a great model, but they actually do have a lot of good private dispute resolution models, whether that's um, arbitration led by a self-regulatory organization or within an, a trading platform. Um, within an industry standards body like ISDA. Um, there's lots of good examples out there. I think the financial industry has also unfortunately had to, had to take the view that code does not always work the way we want it to. And so I think that to me is where a lot of disputes could arise. Um, and I think we just have to be aware of that fact. <laughs> Um, but then also there, I think there, there can be issues where, for example, someone's, someone's party to a smart contract and one side does not deliver because one party's account doesn't have sufficient funds, et cetera. Um, we have lots of disputes over like whether a credit event has occurred and we have the ISDA credit determinations committees to, to help work through disputes about that. Um, there's, so th there's there's a lot of good models out there and we're actually we're working on a paper right now with the world economic forum to to try and go through some of those models and and see what might be appropriate for a blockchain network yeah yes yeah. so if any of you have any input have any experience please feel free to reach out to jenny and myself we'd love to hear from you um as we work through and and co-create the report on models for dispute resolution. With that, um, we are at the end of today's session. And Suzanne, Jenny, it was lovely to, um, to discuss uh, 
very important topics of collaboration with you. Was there anything else you wanted to add before we have one minute left, I guess? Uh, all I would say is I, I look to everyone, uh, bold innovators, this is an opportunity to really transform the way business can be done. Uh, hopefully everyone has uh, the courage and finds the advocates to make this exciting technology possible. Right, I completely agree, and I'm I really enjoy the collaborative projects that I've worked on, and and look forward to to more of this in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Mm -hmm.